My heart this year is to be fruitful for the kingdom of God and to know God better. And so I go back to the Old Testament scriptures. And that's what Paul was doing in Romans, going back to the scriptures, finding out how God is the same yesterday, today and forever. The prophet Jeremiah said this, Blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. That is our heart for this year for the church. And so coming to Paul's letter to the Romans and the particular verses I want to look at today, verse six and seven, God will render to each one, each one according to his works, to those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honour and immortality, he will give eternal life. You can see in that the hope of eternal life and the way towards it is to seek God, to seek glory and honour and immortality in well-doing. And it's in well-doing in the kingdom of God, for God. And then in verse 10, glory and honour and peace is there for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. There's no hierarchy in God. And of course, the context of this, these verses is that Paul is setting out what he means by works, what he means by well-doing, what he means by the ones who do good. And so it's hope for every heart. And in this letter, his message is that God has called him, Paul, to take the message of God's plan of salvation to everyone, everywhere. No discrimination, no partiality. And that God's plan of salvation is that Jesus, the son of God, has atoned for the sin of everyone, everywhere, and fulfilled the promises of God. That's what this is about, the message of Jesus to the world, the message of Jesus to every heart. And you see, the thing is that although Paul was recognising that the gospel began in Israel with the Jews and, and the history and the scriptures there in Israel, and that it went on towards to the, the Roman Empire where he was working and was seeking to reach everyone, the aim was that God wanted to reach everyone everywhere. And he'd been in Athens very recently and seen Athens, a city which had been the most important city in the world, which now was kind of looking a bit threadbare and, and barren because Corinth was now the, the kind of commercial centre and, and but he's looking back and remembering what he said to the Athenians in the Areopagus. And what he'd said was these, this, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And we can see that hope for everything, the world in those verses. And of course, in that time, we can see that Paul writing from Athens there in um, Achaia, and probably writing the, this letter in Corinth, was going back to help Israel back in Judea. And then he was going to go on to Rome. And this is why he's writing the letter sending Phoebe with this letter to, to Rome. But his aim, his aim was to go on from there to Spain. And of course, 
Spain was, from the point of view of Rome, the place where the barbarians lived, those people who were really not worth reaching. And of course, the Jews didn't think they were worth reaching because the Jews had everything anyway. And the Greeks didn't think they were worth re reaching because the Greeks had Rome. They had the Roman Empire. They were the cultured upper class. And that's the situation that Paul was speaking into in Romans. He's he's saying, I want to bring together not just you in Rome, the Greeks, the Gentile church and the Jewish church. He's also saying, I want you to recognize together you have a mission and and I'm going to be part of that to reach beyond to those people you think are not really worth anything. They're just out there, the barbarians, the British, the Spanish, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Africans, the Australians. They're just barbarians. But Paul was bringing each person before God and not generalizing. See, in this second part of what he'd said in Athens was this. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way towards him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. So there in this this place, the Areopagus, he, he was saying to, to them, God loves every human being in every nation. And he doesn't want people to see themselves as part of a general category, the Jews. I'm saved because I'm a Jew or I'm saved because I'm British. He wants everyone to seek God and to find God. And so in this letter to the church in Rome, he says in verse nine, there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. You see, he's recognizing that humanity doesn't naturally find God unless we seek for him. God is reaching out to every human being. But there is this problem of sin. And when you read the, the chapters, the end of what chapter one through to chapter four, you'll find this message of humanity is fallen. Humanity is in need of a savior. And Jesus has come to be that savior. There will be tribulation and distress. But glory and honour and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. God shows no partiality. So God is looking on the heart. This is hope for every heart everywhere. And I, I just put this little um, thing in. It's hope in every age and it's hope everywhere for every heart. And so I want to look a little bit at the background to this, this concept. Where does Paul get this concept that God is interested, not just in Israel, but in every heart, everywhere, in every age? Well, there is, of course, Paul himself. Paul himself was a man who had thought that by being a Jew, he was safe, that by being a Jew and learning the Torah and learning the ways of the Pharisees in the school of Gamaliel, that he himself would be OK. And so when this this strange teaching comes up that that there's a, a savior who's come, who is is saying that everyone can be saved outside of Israel, that, that it's for the whole world. He he got involved and said, no, no, 
it's about the Jews. And so he became a violent oppressor of the church of Jesus. And it wasn't until God came to him, Jesus revealed himself to him on that Damascus road, that Paul recognized, realized that he was in fact persecuting the very God he wanted to serve. And he had to do a U-turn. And of course, when we place Jesus on the road to Damascus, we will recognize in a few moments when we look at the Old Testament that Paul would have said, oh, my goodness. I need to turn around, find a, a re-understanding, a reconfiguration of everything I've learned. And then it will include everyone from every nation. So Paul himself recognized that Jesus had reached out to him, his heart individually. It wasn't an overall saving of the nation of Israel. It was to each individual heart. And Paul recognized that for himself. But what about Jesus' ministry? Well, I could, I could give you many, many illustrations of Jesus' ministry being not just to everyone, but to individuals. And so there's Zacchaeus. And, you know, you all know the story of Zacchaeus and how Jesus saw him there in the in the sycamore tree and called him down and said, come down, I must stay at your house. And Zacchaeus absolutely astonished that Jesus would recognize him individually. Hope for the heart of even Zacchaeus. And then I want to, to perhaps point to the woman at the well. Jesus there on his own after a tiring journey and meets this woman and spends time with her and reveals to her, in a sense, the first time, a woman outside of Israel reveals to her that he is the Messiah. And she's she's astonished. She's offered living water that will she will never thirst again because Jesus is that living water. He gives her hope for the future. Hope for her heart. And I hope this is beginning to register that. Very often we see things generally, but God sees every heart individually, not just in general. And then, of course, there's Nicodemus. Unless a man be born again, unless each heart is born again. They can't enter the kingdom of heaven. And that was such a strange thing for Nicodemus. But Jesus showed that he cared so much for this this one individual man. It's hope for every heart. A heart for each person in healing, in teaching, in deliverance. A heart for each person on the cross. See what Jesus did on the cross reached every human being. It took on board the sins of the whole world, but it took on board the sins of each individual person. And all we need to do is to turn to Jesus for hope. And what about the Old Testament? Because you see, Paul had to bring into focus the fact that this hope for every heart is in line with God's purposes across the whole of eternity and not just a short time, not just now, not just the future, but was it in line with the Old Testament? And so he would have thought about the unnamed servant that Abraham sent off with the hope of the promise in his hands in, a, in one sense. And this servant who we don't know, it may be Eliezer, but he comes to a well and, and he says to 
to God, look, God, I've, I've been sent and I'm going to ask you one thing. And, and are you, I'm not really expecting that, that you know me, but Abraham sent me. So, so could you just answer this? And before the servant had finished speaking in his heart, so he hadn't spoken this out loud, Rebecca came out with her water on her shoulder and went to this, and offers to, to give water to all of the camels of this servant and shows that God is interested in the promise of Israel, but also the prayer of this unknown servant. And then, of course, there's the widow of Zarephath, who was there and and it's in a time of drought and and she's got practically no flour she's got no water she's got nothing she's a widow so she has no inheritance but God says to the prophet it's okay don't worry I've spoken into the heart of this lady and she will be there for you in Zarephath so just pop down to Sidon and so the prophet goes there and Elijah meets this woman who has been called by God. And she has hope because God, through the prophet, meets her at the gate of the city. She's just gathering sticks for fire. But he asks for some water and she is doing good by offering him a drink, even in drought. And he says, could you give me something to eat? And she hasn't really got very much. And of course, you know that as a result of this, she had hope because God filled her little flask of oil continually and gave her bread to eat. And eventually when her son died, the prophet gave her back her son. And Paul knew these things, knew that God had given hope to people outside of Israel, hope for every heart. This was in line with what God had said to him through Jesus on the Syrian road to Damascus. And then, of course, my favourite one, as you all know, the unnamed girl who was in forced labour, Naaman, the commander of Syrian army, goes down from Damascus on his horse and he captures this girl and takes her into forced slavery where she becomes the, the servant, the slave of his wife, Naaman's wife. But Naaman gets leprosy. And this little girl says, don't worry, don't worry, because there's hope for Naaman. There is hope for him because in Israel, there's a prophet. And if you go to him, he will tell you how to be healed. And I can imagine Paul on remembering being on the road to Syria, the Damascus road, that he had been opposing what this little girl had done. That she had offered hope to Damascus in the name of God, in the name of the prophet. And yet he had been going to oppose it and to be just like Naaman as the aggressor. So you can see how Paul, this is so real in Paul's heart that, that it's hope for every heart. The unnamed people and the high and mighty. When we look at the, 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 the Psalms, we see, Lord, who shall so sojourn or reside in your tent? Who shall dwell in your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. Hope for every heart. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night, my heart instructs me. I've set the Lord before me. He's at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. There is hope. My heart is glad. My whole being rejoices. My flesh dwells secure. I have hope because 
of God. Guide me with your counsel and afterwards, afterwards, hope for the future. You will receive me to glory. Whom I have I in heaven but you. There's nothing in, on earth I desire but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. You can hear the psalmist, David, crying out to the Lord and saying, I know that everyone, everyone has the hope if they seek for God. And of course, what this is based on in the Old Testament is this sense that a covenant was coming, a promise was going to be revealed and fulfilled. And in those days, I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. You see, Paul knew these scriptures and his heart had been touched. The law had been put on his heart now. It wasn't just the 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 pharisaic thing of the law as a as a garment on the outside the law is now written on his heart that everyone could know the lord could know the salvation of god it's hope for every heart hope for you and for me and as i mentioned in the prayer email this morning paul actually quotes from psalm 62 for God alone, my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. My hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, and I shall not be. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times. People, all people, everywhere, every individual, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for each one of us. To you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love, for you will render to a man according to his work. And that's what Paul quotes. But he knows Psalm 62. There in Romans 2, he will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honour and immortality, he will give eternal life. There is hope for every heart in the gospel. And I said earlier on that, that this was aimed in Romans at breaking down some of the barriers that were there and that are there today, the social divines. Now, many of you will remember um, this sketch that I'm just going to show you. It's just 20 seconds or so. But this is something that came out in the BBC back in the 60s. I look down on him because I am upper class. I look up to him because he is upper class. But I look down on him because he is lower class. <laughs> I am middle class. <laughs> I know my place. <laughs> And that, of course, is a sketch which highlights the fact that we still have these walls, these divides, whether they're social, whether they're wealth, whether they're skin colour, whether they're race, whether they're religion. God shows no partiality. And so I want to finish today by saying we, every one of us has a calling to bring the gospel to every heart, to give hope to every heart. And I'm going to turn to Romans 15, as I did last week, to show that Paul bookends his arguments. And there in this letter at, towards the end, he says this, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves, let each of us, everyone, please his neighbour. Well, who is my neighbour? Who is my neighbour? The Samaritan. 
to please his neighbour for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So I know you probably think that, you know, I overemphasize the Old Testament background to this. But no, this is what Paul is doing. He's saying this hope has come to us through Israel. And now it's spreading through through the Roman Empire, but it's to reach every heart everywhere. It is hope for every heart. So let's be a church that reaches out. Let's be a church that sees that everybody is of equal value because God shows no partiality. Let's reach out and give hope to everyone. Amen.